When I was thinking about who would compose the music for my life story, there was only one person I really considered. The New Zealand singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, synth-pop legend, Lady Hawk. Number one, because I'm a sucker for a killer hook. Sue me. And that is 100% Lady Hawk's wheelhouse. And number two, she's autistic. I figured if anyone would get the vibe we were going for, it would be her. But Lady Hawk, whose offstage name is Pip Brown, isn't just a pop star. She's also a parent, a prolific gamer, and now possibly my new best friend. But she can probably tell you all that herself. Hey, I'm Lady Hawk, or you can call me Pip. Uh, I'm from New Zealand. I'm a singer-songwriter. I've been making music for a very, very long time now. <laughs> and yeah, I'm just residing in Auckland currently, Auckland, New Zealand, and um, handling the pandemic like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so so do me a favor and like describe your music for people who haven't heard it. Uh, so I guess my sound is um, like I'm big on nostalgia. So whatever, you know, that, brings to me is what sort of comes out in my music so like I I try and make a song that makes you feel nostalgic listening to it even though you mightn't have heard it before so um you know vintage synths um driving beats like just all that sort of stuff I I just love I love nostalgic pop um so I guess I'm indie pop electro a little bit of rock (laughs) did you listen to a ton of music when you were a kid or did you grow up in a musical household yeah, I was um just loved music from as early as I can remember and my mum has always been big into music. She, you know, she played guitar and and plays piano, still does, sings. Um she was in bands as well, um church bands. <laughs> but bands nonetheless. <laughs> I love no. I love the caveat there like yeah. she's in church oh, bands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so um so you were always like music was just like in the ether for you. Yeah, yeah. And then my my stepdad came along when I was like 12 years old and he he um bought like drums into the house and like he's a he's an incredible drum drummer and he play he plays everything. He plays like uh trumpet, you know, cornet, guitar, bass, everything. And he he like our whole living room was just set up with instruments and um I learned drums uh from like 12, age 12 up until I left school. Um, so drums were, that was my main instrument for a long time. Um, and yeah, I, we, I was just surrounded in it, surrounded by music. Describe Little Pip for me. What were you like <laughs> as a kid? I was incredibly shy, painfully shy, clung to my mum, very thoughtful and big daydreamer, lost in my head all the time, very sensitive, very, very sensitive. Yeah, I was just a sort of quiet, sweet, sweet little angel. (laughs) I mean, Um, I mean, that's one way of describing yourself. And then I and then I became a teenager, and that went out the window. But um, yeah, no, I was yeah, I was a very shy, very quiet kid who, you know, always struggled in social situations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that sensitivity, or what did that sensitivity or that struggle look like, um, when you were young? I think it looked like to other people, I think it looked like I wasn't paying attention or um I was I was weird, maybe. Um I got called weird a lot. <clears throat> I remember being around uh, seven years old and we got uh, in class the teacher was like, Right, um everyone in class paint a monster. You can do whatever you want, just paint a monster and I was like, took it so seriously. I was like this monster's gonna have fifty eyes and and sixty legs, and I I wanted it to have all these things, and I was painting and painting, and then it was lunchtime, and she was like, "Right, fin- everyone's finished," and I was like, "But it's not finished. I haven't done a hundred legs. I'm still painting the, the the monster." Like, and so she let me stay for the rest of the day painting the damn monster, like because I had to do every leg and every eye and <laughs> so that was me 
I, I, I feel that, like I feel that acutely because while I wasn't, I wasn't quite like that, like the, the particularity or the, or the focus on, on a thing, um, like it has to be right, you know, yeah. is, is, is very familiar to me. And so, so this like sensitivity, like, was it at home? Was it just at school? Was it just sort of like in the world? Like, tell me how your, your, your sensitivity manifests when you're a kid. So home was like my, my like comfort space, you know? So I was just myself, like freely, my quirky, you know, I was always a bit of a, you know, around my family and stuff. I was a bit of a clown and, but, you know, and then, you know, school and, and the outside world was, was a bit harder, like, and I was very sensitive, especially sensitive to sound. Like, it's funny because I, I say this to people, like, and they're like, but you're a musician. I'm like, I know, like, I don't find, it's a different loudness I'm talking about. I don't find the loudness of music. That's not the sensitive thing for me. It's like, I remember being a little kid and walking down the street and a loud motorbike would go past and I would get this, like, internal like I would want to combust, like just like I'd want to put my hands over my ears and scream. And um, I just hated that sound. So to this day, it's a trigger for me, like hearing a loud car or a loud motorbike. It's like it gives me such a fright. So that was a huge, that those sorts of sounds for me were like re- a real big, um, they would scare me. I'd get really scared. And I sort of still have that a little bit, mm-hmm. um, but I don't outwardly show it anymore. <laughs> What what did that look like when you were a kid? Like, like did it did it make you cry? Like, did anyone mm. help you out? Like, I would yeah, I would just cr- like, you know, always cuddle into my mum and like bury my head in her and and you know cry sometimes. And um, I just think mum always thought I was just a really sensitive kid. You know, I was a little kid in the eighties, and it's like no one really thought much beyond that. You know, it's like. Just I was just sensitive, a little bit mm-hmm. arty, you know. <laughs> just a little bit arty. How old are yeah. you? Remind me of how old you are. Forty-two. I'm forty-three, girl. What? Come on now. <laughs> yeah. Come on. There we go. <laughs> I was Amazing. born in 1978, so I yeah, I, I, I'm I know what you're, I know what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like you know, being a weird little kid. You know, a lot of kids are weird. Because they get like really into their things, you know, and they haven't yet. They're still trying to figure out who they are. And so people are, I think, a little bit more permissive of like weirdo little kids. But like you can't be a weirdo in middle school and you can't be a weirdo in high school. And I wonder, like, did you come to perceive your so-called weirdness in any different way as you got older? Yeah, I just never understood why I didn't... I could see that I didn't feel like the other kids or like the other girls, at least. I didn't see myself in other girls. And and I, and I struggled with that. Like, you know, I was a little bit different, like in, in the sense that like, I just wasn't girly. I, and, I, and I guess a lot of it's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. You know, there's this like, my sexuality that I wasn't aware of (laughs) then there's like you know possible mental health stuff going on like just the fact that I'm sensitive all these different things you know going on that I was completely oblivious to so I think over the years as I got older I learned to adapt and like I was always heavily into music Um, and by the time I got to like 16 I was just fully immersed in music and I was playing in bands in school and all of a sudden kids thought my weirdness was cool. So like I was in a band and I was playing drums and I was odd. I was a little bit kooky. And um, that's when I realized that doing music was something that people could relate to and it seemed to draw people to me. And so like that was a way for me to connect that was like the first time I remember being thinking, oh, I can connect to people now because everyone loves music and I love music and I play it. And yeah, and that also unfortunately around the same time was when I learned that drinking helps my social anxiety. <laughs> so, so that's when my teen, the teen uh, 
drinking started. Oh God, <laughs> I know. <laughs> what was the, what was the name of your first band? Do you remember? Oh my God, it's the worst name. We were called Gel, like the hair gel. It's just I don't even know who thought that like, name up. Like but... G E L. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's not. Yeah. T- I don't think that's terrible. I remember like, at the time thinking it was terrible. I was like, shit, this is bad. <laughs> so music was like your escape. Like music yeah. was where you could sort of bury yourself in a good way. And like you found relief there. Yep. Yeah, I always have. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then what, like at what point were you like, huh, I think this is like my path. Like I think this is... Like or or maybe you didn't make that decision. It just was made for you because you're you were having increasing success. I went to so when high school finished, I went to university um, and studied a bachelor of design. So while like at the same time as applying for that, I applied for the school of music in Wellington, and I ended up deciding to go to the school of design. While at the design school, I met a couple of other kids exactly the same age as me. Um, who wanted to be in a band and I was like yeah I play I play drums play guitar like you know let's start a band so I started a band and um we we were just like popping off in my town (laughs) you know like it was going really well and that that's when I was like I realized because I was I was majoring in photography I realized everything I was doing in my degree was was music related so I would every project was photographing bands or going to live gigs and you know like all my off-campus activities were like music editor for the local magazine I was like doing all this sort of stuff and I was like this is actually what I want to be doing I'm really glad I'm not studying it because sometimes studying something can take the joy out of it Um, totally totally yeah so I ended up like touring with my band we went to the states and everything and I ended up missing my graduation because I was in New York playing a show so I think Ah. that's like that was kind of the whole awakening for me I was like yeah this is this is all I'm gonna do now so so you're you've gone to college but you you're skip your graduation you're you're in this band it's successful like did you feel then like you're like oh I'm not like I'm not a weirdo I'm not different like my my struggles my socializing like everything kind of felt better or was that just under the surface for you yeah it was like like life just kept moving for me and like I didn't want to stand still and I I did have crippling anxieties but I also I I couldn't stand to not keep moving you know like I needed to keep moving so I I went wherever the music took me and I I would say the fact that I've done music as a career and I've literally had to force myself to be in situations that that everything inside of me is going no don't get on that plane don't sit in that fuselage with 300 <laughs> strangers you know like it, every part of my body was telling me not to do that yet I had to constantly do it I just constantly be on airplanes you know, and so I, I knew I still had some stuff going on. Like I knew there, there was some crippling stuff going on, but that's just for me. I was like, I have to keep going. So I have to do whatever it takes to make this, this easier, which unfortunately for me was drinking and taking pills, which was like just self-medicating with Xanax and, and alcohol. So that's, that's how I was able to just like go on the plane and like p- play shows and do all this stuff. But I knew I had to do it. I just didn't know how to without the help of these other things. Right. Yeah, I think I've always had um, a, a lot of ambition, but I always needed more. Mm-hmm. I was just like this hungry monster that was never satisfied, you know, and I just needed more and more and more, and I wanted to just devour everything and see as much as I could, and the the desire for all of that overrode the, yeah. the inside stuff that was going on and telling me to stay put Mm -hmm. so in a way I'm glad I know I'm I'm a bit of a sort of like an oxymoron I'm like I'm a little bit of both and I'm I'm opposite you know I'm I'm one thing and then another but it's because I have I have to have these things done I you know I can't not see something through right I have to do it I have to do it you know oh yeah I mean you're you're speaking my language here uh I, I I feel as though I'm like an 
introverted extrovert. And, yeah, that's what I've always said about myself too. Right, right. And that, you know, uh, it is, you know, I mean, going through this process like of, you know, getting a diagnosis and then and then having to tell people and people being like, get out, like, shut oh, up. Yeah. You know, yeah, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and I'm like, interesting that you in this 30 seconds became an autism expert and you're telling me yeah. about my life. But OK, cool. Um, yeah. But I wondered, like, did you ever have a clue? You're like, because you felt like you were a little bit weird, a little bit different. Then you found music and it was a relief. But did you sense like something's something? There's something else. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. there was that f- feeling for me. And when I was living in Melbourne, I was struggling a lot with going outside. I was struggling with like getting on public transport to go to my job, which was I worked at a bar. And I was like, it's just, it was just so. I, and I remember thinking to myself, this shouldn't be this hard for a person. Other people don't find it that hard to walk out their front door and like get in a, train or is it because I was in uh, Melbourne get on a tram and and you know get the number 86 tram to Collingwood where I worked but for me it was like I would I I had the cyclical thoughts in my head of everything that could go wrong in the time that I stepped out of the door and hopped onto the tram so for me my biggest fear has always been the unpredictability of other people and I hate getting on like public transport and not knowing what's going to happen because strangers are just like crazy instantly crazy to me I'm like anyone could do anything at any point and and like so I hopped on a tram I really really mentally worked myself up to it and I got on the tram I was like sweating and I felt sick I was like I'm nauseous I'm nauseous and I was sitting there and this like junkie couple hopped on the, the next stop and instantly the chick just puked on the ground no. and I went and that's my worst, that's like my worst nightmare. Like you couldn't put me in a worse situation. And I was like, ah. <laughs> I was having a meltdown and like had to get off the tram. And I called my girlfriend at the time and I was like, I'm off the tram. Come, come get me. Help me. Someone, a junkie puked. <laughs> like, so, that was. Um, I'm, I'm laughing so much because this is like, this is exactly my feeling like I feel you on this so hard because like I do not like that unpredictability of like any kind of erratic behavior is very stressful to me so like me too and I'm fearful that the thing is gonna impact me like what's happening I'm fearful that it's gonna happen on me oh yeah well you don't want to get barfed on (laughs) I don't want to get bathed on or pooped on or like all the things I've seen happen. My social anxiety when I was a kid up and through probably, you know, uh, college was like that I would throw up in public and I would make myself so nervous about the idea. And I would and because I was anxious about that, I would get a stomach ache. And the stomach ache would say to me, oh, you're going to throw up in public. So so I would have to, like, sit out. Like, I'd be all ready to go for, like, Halloween trick-or-treating and then feel super anxious, feel like I was going to throw up, and then have to sit it out. And I never puked, ever. I never yeah, did. You, you've just described my entire childhood. That exact thing yeah. was my thing. And I always oh God. would work myself up to the point where I felt nauseous and then I'd be like, I'm going to puke. I'm going to puke. I'm going to puke. I'm yes. going to puke. And I'd be like, please don't puke. Please don't puke. Oh my God. I would never puke. And I'd always have to get sent home from school as well. Like, and I'd be like, I can't, I can't do this class. I'm, I feel sick. I feel sick. I'm going to be sick. And right. Like, right. It was just like, was awful. And it, it followed me around for years. That shit. Oh like, my God. Me too. Me too. I mean, it, it, it is, it, it, it is so debilitating And, you know, it just, it feels so bad. It feels so bad to have anxiety like that, that is like irrational, that is preventing you from doing things. Anyway, so you, so you're like on this tram and the junkie barfs and you're like, I'm done. And so I'm guessing at that point you were like, this feels atypical. 
Yeah, it was for me. It was I didn't know. I didn't have any words to put to it, and I was like, "There's something going on," and I knew I needed help, but I didn't didn't seek it out for a while after that. Like, I then moved to Sydney, and um, because Nick, who I was making music with, lived in Sydney, and I and just the scene there was where I wanted to be. I wanted to, I had loads of friends up there making music, so me and my girlfriend at the time moved up to Sydney, and um, which was an amazing move for me. But it also, it, it sort of made me face that stuff head on because I was like, well, now I'm living in King's Cross in Sydney, which is like junkie capital <laughs> of Australia, you know. And I was like, this is, you know, I, I was sort of living behind the police station and I heard the things I heard at night time. I just, I'll tell you, I, I couldn't, <laughs> it was awful. Like, um and I and the anxiety levels were just terrible, and you know, like my my thought patterns. And I so I I, that, I remember thinking I need to I need to talk to somebody about it. And I started seeing a therapist in Sydney. And um, I remember after seeing her for a bit, she said, um, "I think you have mild Asperger's." She so so nonchalantly said that, and I was like, "What? Yeah, I think you have mild Asperger's." And I was like. Right. Okay. Bye. And I left and never went back. Right. And then I spent then I spent years with that, and and didn't know how to process it or what to do with it, and like went through this entire journey without ever following it up. And um, mm. then finally, like, got sober, which was great. Did it all on my own. Congratulations. Um, That's great. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm seven years sober now. Oh, amazing. Um, yeah, and um. Then started seeing a therapist two years ago who also, um, like, he's amazing um, and he's explained everything about the way my brain works. And um, and he also diagnosed me with OCD, with obsessive compulsive disorder um, of the, the, not the type where you, like, have to turn a light switch on and off or do that, sort of, but this the repetitive cyclical thoughts. It's mm-hmm. like, that's all wrapped up in everything to do with you. So... You know, and and generalized anxiety disorder and depression, of course, <laughs> just to you know round it all off nicely. Um. I know, I know. I mean, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's always like a super twofer, you know. You know, you know, it, yeah, it never yeah. just it's never just one thing. It's like it's like a whole collection. It's like a cornucopia of shit, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and and how to wade through it. And so for you, like you, you get sober and you. You have like you go see this great therapist. Um, did it did it fuck you up learning all this stuff? Did it did it make you did it provide you with relief? Like, yeah, you know, was it was it like ah, finally I understand myself, or was there some period where you're like spinning out because it's like ah, so much stuff. I think the the point I got to where I where I got help with my current therapist who I've been with for a couple of years now, I was at one of the worst points of my life. So I think I was at that point where I I had postnatal depression as well. Oh, That's another Lord. lovely thing I was diagnosed with. So I um I was at such a point in my life that I was desperate to try anything. I just wanted to be helped. I felt terrible and I remember thinking, I don't want to be this person for my daughter. I want to do everything in my power to make myself the best person I can be, not just for myself, but for her. So she sees me at my best all the time. Um, well, obviously not all the time, but you know, like <laughs> as good as I could give her. So um, yeah, I went, I, I sort of went to, to see him and, uh, and all the, the stuff he explained to me and the diagnoses and, you know, starting medication was a, just an absolute relief. Like, I felt like, you know, I said to him it through tears because I was crying, <laughs> as you do in mm-hmm, therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, I just wish that this had happened to me years ago. Like, I wish I'd met you <laughs> years ago, you know, and he just listened to me and he, he knew exactly. And he explained stuff to me like, he was like, oh, of course you're feeling like that. That's because this is happening. Your, your brain's making way too much adrenaline. It's sending out. SOS signals every time you see something mildly stressful to you it's sending out adrenaline like something horrific's about to happen he was like so that puts too much adrenaline in your system it makes you exhausted your um serotonin's depleted 
So we need to we need to help your brain to get back to making serotonin at a normal level. So that he explained it in that way. And I was like, no one's ever said that to me. Like, I've never had it explained like that. And, you know, he talked me through the medication. He was like, you're going to feel really bad at first because it does. Like, you know, but you've got to push through it. And he was like, message me every single day. You know, when you when you take when you take the pill, pop your earbuds in and go for a walk, listen to a podcast, you know, get into that headspace and um and push through it. And then after, you know, hopefully after just a week, you should be feeling great. And, you know, having that connection and that sort of like just nonchalance, but like very he was just so careful with the way he talked to me and he was very like caring and like made it out like nothing was a big deal like oh of course you're worried about taking the pill of course this you know like I've always been so scared of having an allergic reaction that would make me throw up so (laughs) it all goes back to that (laughs) yeah 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 so so like you you landed on you landed on a name or names for for how you were feeling and how you were acting and and that was a great relief amongst other things like how did you talk to your friends and family about it did you or were you just like this is my private thing to deal with and you know I'll just deal with it with the Asperger's thing like when that happened I I yeah I did tell people and then I faced years of oh everyone's a bit like that oh oh no there's nothing wrong with you you're nah nah like I faced years of that so I just stopped talking about it yeah um and then with the OCD diagnosis and, you know, all the other stuff, I think because that's happened in the last two years, discussion with mental illness is so much more out in the open now. So that when I've told my friends, everyone's actually gone, oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, that that does make a lot of sense. Yeah, we understand, you know, so I've had, especially with the postnatal depression, I think that was, that was very obvious to everybody because I was not you know, I was not coping very well. So I think like having those diagnoses, I just had a lot of support from people. And I think the Asperger's one has been, was the, because it happened so long ago, Yeah. Um, was, you know, unfortunately the timing of that just wasn't great. Right. This <laughs> wasn't great for me and for people's understanding or acceptance of it. Um, so I just, I, I unfortunately just had to bury it and move on. Yeah. Which is what I did. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know that people's understanding is that much better now. No, um, no. I mean, and it, it just like people don't get it. Like people don't have a sense of what that means. And people, people just think like you should be like Rain Man or like rocking in a corner or something like that, which like, I'm yeah, like, yeah. sometimes I am rocking in a corner. So shut up. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's been really, you know, if you tell people, I'm guessing at least women, you say, I have postnatal depression. People are like, I get it. Like, I understand. And even with anxiety, I think we know enough about that. People are like, I get it. But Mm. I think if you say autism, people are like, what the fuck? Like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You know? And that's frustrating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. Because the way it's been portrayed, I think, in media is just one aspect of, of autism as well. I you know, like they say, it's a spectrum, as is everything, you know, sexuality, everything. But, but the way the media has always portrayed it in films is the way I think people think that's what it is. So like when you say, oh, I've got Asperger's, oh, what's that? Oh, it's a, you know, it's on the autism spectrum. They're like, no, you're not. (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and then there's no real response that you can give that feels satisfying. You're just like, yeah, yeah. I'm always like, all right. Yeah, whatever. I guess you're an expert. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Is is there like, n- now that you've sort of processed all of these things in a, you know, in a healthier, safer way, like, have you come to a different understanding of the way that all of these traits operate in your life? Like, have you made peace with it or with this collection of of diagnoses or traits or whatever where you just like, you feel like, okay, that's me. Like, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I have. And I think I've come to a point where I'm really proud of myself. Like I'm proud of who I am and, and, and the sort of person it makes me. And I've, I'm proud that I got to the point in my life where I could 
do some positive things for my mental health and be, you know, surround myself with people who can support me and help that. I think it's um, for a long time I was, I was running away and and ignoring it and didn't want to face it. So yeah, I'm totally I'm in such a good place now, and I'm 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 glad I am who I am. I mean, just talking to you, like you seem like a total delight and like a joyful person, and I think people have a notion that you know you say you're autistic or neurodivergent if anybody even understands what that is but like that your your life is all suffering and that mm. you're sad and it's bad and you know to be able to say no nah, I'm I'm cool like I'm in a good place and like knowledge I mean not to be cheesy but like the knowledge is power kind of thing you know yeah yeah exactly yeah it's true one last question um yeah. do you want to be my autistic friend Yes. Yes. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Yes. Woo, you could show me all the things in DC. Oh, my God. It would actually be a great honor and a pleasure of mine if you came here. Thank you so much, Pip. Awesome. Really appreciate cool. it. Oh, thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. Yeah, talk soon. Bye. See ya. Bye. You can check out my new best friend, Lady Hawk's latest album, Time Flies, on your favorite streaming service. And you can find her on Instagram and Twitter at ladyhawk for you. That's Ladyhawk with an E. This episode was produced by David Ja and edited by Sophie Crane. Mix engineering by Jake Gorski. Special thanks to Janina Finn for making this happen. Thanks to you, friend, for listening. <laughs>